I only printed a little bit of the dense um, <coughs> resume that uh, we have for Margaret Nelson, and I can't help but call you Peggy, I'm sorry. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> so, um, back in 1995, she moved from State University of New York to Arizona State University and was part of a move to that, um, our colleagues up to the north, uh, creating a really, really strong uh, anthropology department up there that has really thrived. And we've, I think, benefited at, Ar at Archaeology Southwest from having great relationships with the folks at ASU as well as here <coughs> in at the University of Arizona. So uh, this place, I've been saying fairly regularly lately that Tucson is the archaeological capital of America. There are more professional archaeologists <laughs> here in this community than anywhere across the entire United States. And so Peggy's um, first uh, start in the Mimbris area was way back in the 70s. And <laughs> Stephen LeBlanc got things rolling back there with the, uh, a major project in the Mimbris Valley. And what's really, I think, impressive is that cohort of people that got their uh, starts back as graduate students in that era have continued on uh, in follow-up research in, in that area, and they've continued to bring students on. So we are now the beneficiary of that process. Um, Peggy's student, Karen Schollmeyer, is now a preservation archaeologist at Archaeology Southwest, right over there. And uh, so we are uh, benefiting, again, from that deep history of the, in the members area. Uh, within Archaeology Southwest as well. So, Peggy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight, and I look forward to hearing the perspectives on members, landscape, and people. So I will turn this mi microphone off so we don't get a feedback. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bill and Linda Pierce, for inviting me to come and talk to you about membranes. It's my favorite subject, so how could I say no? Um, I've been working in the membranes area, as Bill said. You said so very long ago. <laughs> that didn't feel good, Bill. <laughs> um, I want to, though, reiterate something that Bill said before I get started, and that is that Tucson is extremely fortunate because I think it has the highest number of membrane archaeologists, not just the highest number of archaeologists, but the highest number of membrane archaeologists. And I was very fortunate as a graduate student to work with Pat Gilman, Paul Minnis, Roger Anion, Ben Nelson, whom I later married. <laughs> and then to be able to bring my own students into the field, like Karen Schollmeyer and Michael Deal, to themselves become membrane archaeologists and be part of the Tucson community. So um, we're all lucky. I've only been here a year now, and I've already gotten back into. Ben and I had um, Pat, Paul, and Roger over to our house, and we sat down in the living room, and it might as well have been 1975. <laughs> we were right back to talking about what we used to talk about. <clears throat> so we're delighted to be here. Um, on my title slide, I included this stunning black and white bowl, which was one of the bowls that we excavated in the eastern Membrace area. And there's a lot of debate about Membrace bowls and how they should be viewed and how they should be talked about. But I included it here because it represents, it's partly responsible for site destruction, the looting of sites, because people want to own them. But as well, it's responsible for preservation and the protection of sites because people recognize the richness of membrane sites and want to make sure they're preserved and protected. Today I want to talk about, well, I'll touch on site looting and to site damage, but I want to focus on site protection, in particular and specifically the knowledge that's gained. We're, we're preserving history, prehistory, but we're also making possible a kind of knowledge about membrane lives and landscapes that can only come from really well-preserved deposits. I'll also just say that I'm a walker. I walk around, but 
I'm not allowed to, so <laughs> because of the spotlight, etc. So I'm doing my best here to stay still. Um, I first came to the Membrace uh, area, as Bill mentions, as a graduate student from the University of California at Santa Barbara. At the time, I was studying linguistics and archaeology and going to make my mark in the Great Basin. But I got the opportunity in the mid-1970s to work for the Membrace Foundation with Steve LeBlanc in the Membrace Valley. And so I got in a car with some friends, and I drove over there. And we all got out at the Maddox site. And the Maddox site is a pit house and classic site right in the center of the Membrace Valley, at which Archaeology Southwest now is taking some responsibility for. So it's a, if you ever get a chance to go there, it's right off the road. It's very easy to see. And it's a wonderful site with a trail through it, with an interpretive trail. <clears throat> but that was my first experience. And I was actually supervised there by Pat Gilman. Um, later that summer, I was asked to go to a site called the Montezuma site which is a pit, also a pit house and classic site. It's up on a higher terrace or ridge above the Membrace Valley, up further north. And um, we had identified what we thought was an intact pit house, which looks something like that. That's actually not it. That's at another site. I don't have a picture of the one that we excavated. And that's Roger Anion sitting in the rampway of the pit house. So pit houses are semi-subterranean structures. So it's, this is the below ground part um, that we're were built and used um, before AD 1000. Anyway, we had identified a pit house we thought we, was intact, and we started um, to excavate it. And uh, I was screening that summer. Um, Southwest Archaeology was new to me, so I stayed on the screen. And um, I was screening the deposits. I screened everything, every bit of dirt, every shovel full of dirt out of this pit house. And when we got near the floor, I was quite excited because this is the first time I was going to be able to see what we could learn about Membrace lives from the pit house floor, what was in the hearth, the way the posts were aligned, and so on. And as we were uncovering the floor and we came across the hearth, it was a stone lined hearth, there was a big pick mark right through the hearth, a big railroad pick. I can't <laughs> tell you how discouraged I was. We had worked weeks on that pit house, and there was very little that we could recover. Not nothing, but very little we re could recover from it. And that was my first experience with actually seeing the impacts that looting has on ha what we can know about members' culture, about members' traditions and people. That's a bulldozer on a classic site. Those piles are made by the bulldozer. Membrace looting and bulldozing has a very long tradition in the life of the Membrace region. I want to uh, quote something that Bill Doley said in that, uh, an Archaeology Southwest volume that Michelle Hegman and I uh, edited. Bill wrote the last piece on the back. And Bill says, and I quote from him, it is discouraging that collectors and pot hunters will destroy over 90%, that's the estimate for the Membrace region, over 90% of the heritage that is a remarkable peoples left behind in order to put an undeniably stunning pot in their collection. It is discouraging. But he adds, on the other hand, those stunning pots have inspired a surprising amount of good behavior as well. That good behavior, of course, is preservation. Motiva motivated, as I said earlier, by people knowing of the richness of knowledge that's held in membrane sites. So today I want to tell you three stories that come from the opportunity we've had to study intact deposits of membrane sites and tap that knowledge to understand some new aspects of membrane lives and landscapes. Before I start with my stories, I want to give you a little background on Membrace region, Membrace archaeology. I know, looking around, some of you know the Membrace very well. You can take a nap. <laughs> I'll wake you up when I'm done. Uh, but <clears throat> I want to make sure that we're all on the same page with respect to what um, these various phases and periods represent in the Membrace area. So the Membrace region um, is en encompasses three major river systems, the Upper Gila, which is where archaeology uh, Southwest is working right now. Um, the Membrace River Valley, which is where I started working, where the Membrace Foundation 
So the upper Gila, the Membrace River Valley, this is where the Membrace Foundation did it, the bulk of its work. And the Eastern Membrace, which is the Rio Grande, which is where I've done the bulk of my work as a professional after graduate school. I just want to show you a few, sh a few slides of those rivers so you can see uh, what the topography and landscape does look like. This is the one in the center. This is the Membrace Valley. Very nice wide floodplain. This is where people grew mainly maize, beans and squash, and a few other cultigens. The eastern membrace is drier. So over along the Rio Grande, it's just a drier area. It doesn't get as much rainfall. Um, and, but it still has some nice floodplains where people could farm. Here we are on the, at the top. It's at 11,000 feet, the Black Range. Looking, it separates the eastern membrace from the membrace valley. And we're looking down at the eastern membrace at a classic summer thunderstorm. Because the east doesn't get very much winter precipitation, this was the main source of water um, for crops. Um, but we're all familiar with these kinds of thunderstorms. They're very patchy, and um, but they're wonderful to watch. And then the upper Gila, uh, all the way to the west. And this is the excavation that's going on right now by Archaeology Southwest in the upper Gila. The memory sequence starts a little bit after the Common Era, into the Common Era, um, and has three, excuse me, has four major periods. I'm not going to talk about the first thousand years. I'm skipping the first thousand years. You'll need to bring someone else in to talk about the first thousand years. It's an interesting time, but I only have, you know, 45 minutes. So uh, I'll, I'm going to start talking about um, the periods that follow um, a thousand in the Common Era and go to about the middle of the 1400s. <coughs> and there are two major periods, the classic membrace, which is that pottery that I showed you at the very beginning, and the post-classic. And you can see that there's a gap there. The classic ends in 1130, and the post-classic begins in the early 1200s. That gap has been filled by some of the work that I'm going to talk about today. It's a new phase that we define called the reorganization phase, and which was then also extended to something in the Membrace Valley called the Terminal Classic. So right now, in giving you the sequence, what I want to talk about is the classic and the post-classic, because those are the periods when people were living in villages. In the reorganization phase, they're not. And I'll come back to that. So let me just give you a little introduction to the classic and the post-classic. Around AD 1000, people moved in from the pit houses to above ground Pueblo style architecture with cobble masonry in a sequence of room blocks. And the room blocks are sometimes organized. They're organized in a variety of different ways. Sometimes this way, defining a sort of open area. Sometimes just lines of room blocks. In fact, this is a photograph from 1880 of Cochiti Pueblo, which is, of course, not in the Membrace area. It's in the, uh, along the upper Rio Grande. But I include it because I believe that it is what Membrace Classic Period sites looked like, single story structures with lines of separate room blocks forming village communities. And of course, the beautiful black and white pottery that if you know anything about the word membrace, um, <coughs> you probably know about the pots before you know that membrace means willow. Um, these are beautiful geometric and naturalistic designs. It is the only painted ware made during the classic membrace period made and used. There's an occasional, very rare shirt of this or that, but the dominant, well, really the only, painted ware used in the classic membrace period from 1000 to 1130 are these beautiful black and white pots. In 1130, by 1130, people had left those villages, those cobble masonry villages. They had left them. And then there's no villages that replace them until sometime in the early 1200s. The post-classic villages, instead of being separate room blocks, for the most part, all of them across the membrace, former Membrace region, from the Gila over to the Rio Grande, from west to east, are aggregated, much more aggregated pueblos around interior plazas. And they're made from all kinds of material, combinations of material. Stone, 
only, adobe only, mixtures of stone and adobe at different amounts. Um, some are two, two story, some are one story. There's a lot of variety in the kinds of post-classic villages that we find. And the variety is not just east to west, it's within each of those sub-regions of what was formerly the Membrace area. So there's variety in the kinds of villages that were created then, and there's enormous variety in the pottery. This is the six, six of the kinds of pots that we found in the Eastern Membrace area, but there's up to a dozen different kinds of painted wares. Some are made locally, some are imported. We're sort of working that out now, trying to figure out which ones are imported and which ones are <coughs> made locally and in which areas. Um, but what a contrast to the classic memories period when you had one painted ware being made and used. Now you have, you know, more than half a dozen, up to a dozen different painted wares made in some made all used in what was formerly the Membrace area. In fact, <coughs> these two maps, they show the difference really starkly. So this one is the classic Membrace period. That green blob right there is, is the classic Membrace region. And um, each, one of the each one of the locales has an identical black and white pot representing the kinds of pottery that were used in those locales. In the post-classic, same locales, look at the variety. These are stunningly different social landscapes. And one of the strong questions ever since we started de defining the post-classic was how do you get from there to there? Does everybody, do all these people leave? And then somebody else with lots of variety in their social uh, environment come come in and who are they? Um, I'll get back to that. It's one of the stories that I want to tell you as we move through the work in the Eastern Membrace area. Uh, that's not a bombing range. <laughs> that is the site of Old Town. I include it here because I want to emphasize that though I'm going to be talking about deposits today and what we've been able to learn in a nuanced way from intact deposits. Lots of what I told you about that sequence come from people working on looted sites. I and all the people in Membrace Foundation worked on looted bulldozed sites um, for all the time, the five years that we worked in the Membrace Valley um, on these different um, kinds of sites. And Daryl Creel is brilliant, if you know Daryl. Um, Daryl has excavated around in between these potholes, these are potholes dug by hand, in order to find out quite a lot of information about Old Town. Um, so anything that you read, if you get an opportunity, Old Town's a classic, um, good housing classic site in the lower part of the Membrace Valley. If you get a chance to read about Old Town, remember in the back of your mind, that's what it looks like. And he was able to glean a lot of information from that, despite the fact that it's heavily looted. So to emphasize the importance of site protection, I want to tell you three stories that come from detailed preserved deposits, details that come from de preserved deposits um, about membrace practices and what happened at the end of the classic membrace period. The sites are all from the eastern membrace area where sites have had less impact from looting and certainly very, very, very little bulldozing. And one of the reasons for that is that, as you can see in this picture, there's very little development. In addition, though, in the Eastern Membrace area, very large tracts of land are privately owned, and, and some of, many of those private landowners have a very strong preservation ethic. They've worked very hard to protect sites out there so that they can be studied intact by people who are qualified to do that. One of the fun things about working in the Eastern Membrace area on these big tracts of land, one of them is a 350,000 acre bison ranch. <laughs> if you've ever been around bison, you know that they're really, really curious. They may not be the smartest animal, they're not dolphins, right? <laughs> but they're so curious. And so this is what we regularly experienced. They would come and stand next to our screens, next to our, ex sometimes come down into the excavation units, 
to see what we were doing. We had to make sure the students knew no petting the bison, uh, don't go near them. Uh, but we, we had them watching us day in and day out, and it was actually kind of fun. Um, they also, besides being curious, they're silly. That's a bison on a back dirt pile like this. The screen is gone, and he's rolling on his back with his legs in the air, like a dog. We were stunned when we saw that. Um, they love the back dirt because it's cool. It's hot there when we're there. It's cool, and it's soft, and so they love to roll in it. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the fun uh, of our experience of working in an area like this. Um, of course, areas that are, um, have very little development also have a lot of wildlife. And if you look between those two bison pictures right in there, that's a sizable herd of elk uh, that we also got to see on a daily basis as we were working there on that bison ranch. So let me tell you these three stories. The first one I call coming and going. We've thought of the classic membrane period, that period from AD 1000 to 1130. We've thought of it as a pretty residentially stable period. What I mean by that is that people built their cobble masonry villages, room blocks, and they stayed there. That's the way we've thought about the classic period. And it's in contrast to the way we think of, th thought about or think about the previous pit house period. Pat Gilman and her colleagues have done a nice job of <laughs> demonstrating to us the kind of movement that was common in the pit house period. So up until AD 1000, people were coming and going from sites. In AD 1000, they kind of settled in, built these room blocks, and lived in them until 1130. That's generally the way we thought about it. But the excellent preservation that we've found at one site called Flying Fish in the Eastern Membrace area has allowed us to see some coming and going, actually, during the classic memories period. This is Flying Fish Village. It's on the first terrace above a uh, side drainage to the Rio Grande. It's called Flying Fish because all of that dark area in the back there is a cliff face, and it's covered, covered with rock art. And this is a cliff swallow, but someone thought it was a flying fish. So, uh, and that, ha that was named a long time, way before us. Uh, the spring is called Flying Fish. There's a homestead there called Flying Fish. Uh, there's a well there called Flying Fish. So of course the site had to be called Flying Fish. We didn't have a choice. One of the room blocks on the site, whoops, whoops. Uh, this is just to show you, sorry. That's an artist reconstruction of Flying Fish. It's a, it's a approximately 40 room, four room block, classic period, entirely classic period Pueblo. So it's occupied in that range from 1000 to 1130 and it's located on the side drainage to the Rio Grande. Here's one of our crews. Um, we spent a few years working there and this is one year of crews uh, right here. Michelle Hegman, uh, I think Matt Peoples is back there. Is that Matt Peoples in the background? He was a freshman in college that year. Um, if you know Matt, he's now uh, going up for associate professor at ASU. So this is a while back. As you walk up onto the terrace, there's a little elevated mound that forms one of the room blocks. And that mound had five ha rooms. And if you've ever walked onto a classic memory site, it really just usually looks like a bunch of rubble. You can't define the walls of rooms. But we were able to see at this point on this particular room block, these five rooms that were nicely outlined. One of the things that helped us is the people who built that homestead in around 1900 robbed the stones from the rubble in the middle of the rooms and left the walls there. I don't know why, but thank you. That was really nice for us. So we started excavating in a few of these rooms. We excavated down to the floors, but the floors were very uh, patchy. And we could tell that they were not on the ground surface, the prehistoric ground surface. So we excavated down through those floors and down through those floors. We went down a meter, so three feet roughly, and found some more floors and more walls. But those walls and that, those floors didn't align with the ones that were above them. So people built a, a room block lived in it, left it, it filled, they came back and built this other room block. 
Let me show you what that looks like. This is the one on the top. We excavated fully a couple of rooms in that block and it sat right over the top of that. We didn't excavate all the rooms in this block. We think it has about 12 to 14 rooms in it. So they built this lower block, lived in it. All of the ceramics are classic membranes, black and white. So it wasn't built until after AD 1000. They left it, it fell down. I'm repeating myself, but oh well. It fell down, dirt was blown over, washed over the top of it, and then someone came back still during the classic membranes period and built this other room block, this smaller one, right on top of it. Clear evidence for a sequential classic period occupation with a hiatus between. So people were coming and going. This is the first evidence that I know of, of overlapping deposits with hiatus between that is all during the classic membrane period. <coughs> Harry Schaefer, working at the Nan Ranch, has suggested that there are rooms on the edges of room blocks that are not as substantially built at the Nan Ranch where people would come, build less substantial houses, go, come back, and so on. So there was some movement in and out, but the core population was there, stayed there. There's no sequence, vertical sequence of occupation like we see at Flying Fish Village. So what? This evidence of coming and going was made possible because that room block on the top was not mixed up with, by looters, all the stuff below it. We were able to see it floating above the later room block because it had not been disturbed, because it was intact. And it brings up new questions for us. Are these both the same people building these two room blocks, one on top of the other? They don't align with each other, so maybe not. Where did the earlier occupants go and why did they leave? We're not used to the idea that people in the classic memories period left their room blocks entirely and came back. So why did they? Why did they? Is this just something that happened at Flying Fish and nowhere else? We actually can't answer that question until we have a chance to look somewhere else where there are also deposits that are as intact, as well preserved and protected as the ones at Flying Fish. This is a classic members bowl that I love because that guy is so cranky. <laughs> uh, he clearly doesn't like moving, so why did he go? What's the timing of the hiatus? So we know it's during that 1000 to 1130, but where is it in that hiatus? Is one very early in the classic period and one very late? It would be lovely if we could sort that out with the ceramics, but there are not enough shirts for us to do that. And then I think to me, one of the biggest questions is, does the reoccupation indicate shifting settlement as Pat Gilman is, and others have demonstrated for the classic, for the, excuse me, for the pit house periods? Is this a pattern that is part of the classic lives and ways of using that landscape? Or is it just something at Flying Fish? And we, we need to know that. That was story one. Story two, called Filling the Gap. Seeing continuity. At the beginning of my talking today, I described two periods, the classic and the post-classic. This is actually a site. It was uh, lovely that it was like this because it illustrates very nicely that there's a gap between the classic and the post-classic. This is a site called Los Animus Village, and it had a nice classic occupation, had a few pit houses on it, but not much. A nice 10 room, 10 room block, large classic occupation and a post-classic occupation right next to it. They don't overlap each other. In fact, you hardly find a sherd from the classic membrane part of it into the post-classic part of it, except in one room where they'd gone into a midden that started accumulating about 500, AD 500, all the way through 1400. They, prehistorically, people went into the midden, dug it out, and filled one of these rooms in the post-classic right over here, filled one of these rooms to stabilize it, so they mixed everything up for us. <coughs> Prehistoric looting. In addition to these kinds of village sites in the eastern membrane, these two kinds, 
there are a number of small hamlets. They're not villages. They're usually somewhere between four and 10 or 12 rooms. And they have a mixture of classic memories, black and white, and those post-classic, that variety of post-classic ceramics on them. So we thought, oh, these are good candidates for telling us perhaps what happened in that gap. Maybe they just have a classic occupation and then nothing for 70 years or so, and then a post-classic occupation, but we wanted to have a look. And they, were, they had been preserved and were nicely intact. So we focused on the Hamlet sites to try to get an answer to what happened between 1130 and 1200. The Hamlet sites are located in settings very similar to classic Membrace villages. They're on the first terraces above drainages that run from the Black Range down to the Rio Grande running east. Uh, this gentleman is standing on the Hamlet site. Here's an artist's reconstruction. He's standing about right there. That room right there, that excavation is this right here. So we started with the Hamlet sites. Now in talking about the Hamlets, I'm not gonna start by talking at the top and working down like I just did talking about flying fish. I'm gonna talk about them from the bottom. So I'm going all the way to the bottom of these deposits and I'm talking about what the sequence is working up to the final occupation of the Hamlets. Now this is so exciting, this is probably one of, when people ask me what's one of the most exciting things you've ever found, this is it. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, I'm an archeologist. <laughs> These red arrows are pointing to the clay encasement of Hakal poles, so sticks. All the rock you see, that comes later, ignore it. Th the bottom of these deposits, people built very ephemeral field structures. So this one was stick and mud, Hakal. There are others that were stone, three-walled stone structures. Very ephemeral though, they were just dirt floors, no hearths, no other kinds of facilities. They were like camps, like field camps. Here's one of the three-walled structures. They probably look something like this. And they're entirely classic membrane period. There are no other, either earlier or later ceramics that are associated with them. So beneath the hamlet, there were classic period field camps. And the classic period then settlement arrangement in the eastern membrane looked something like this. So this is not the site I'm talking about in there. This is the whole settlement system. So there were villages like that one I showed you in an earlier slide, classic membrane villages scattered over the landscape were these little field camps that had field structures, very ephemeral. So what, how do the hamlets fit into this? I started talking about hamlets and now I'm talking about field camps. How do the hamlets fit, fit in? The hamlets were built, the hamlet rooms were built by placing stones on the inside and the outside of those Hakal stick and mud structures, of making those Hakal walls more substantial putting in a much more substantial adobe slab floor, adding a formal hearth, usually either colored or stone lined hearth, and often a grinding facility right inside the room. For the three walled structures, there were also ephemeral little field camps. People extended the walls, made them more substantial, put in very substantial post holes. You can see all of these circles are post holes to hold up a much more substantial roof. So they added a fourth wall. This is the hearth. This is the grinding facility. So this is a process by which people are essentially remodeling their own field shelters into more permanent houses. And an important detail of this that we can see because the sites are so well preserved is that the ephemeral structures didn't have time to collapse. They didn't decay. They were extremely well preserved inside of the walls of the classic membrane structures or as part of the walls of the classic membrane structures. So the transition was done between field camps and hamlets. This is a hamlet room now, right here. The transition from this, from these field houses to these hamlet rooms 
was done in very short order, so quickly that the field shelters, the very ephemeral field shelters, didn't have time to collapse. So this is the transition. Classic members field camps turned into hamlet settlements by, we believe, the people who actually had built and used the shelters, the field shelters. Classic period, bottom of those sites, the transition to hamlets and the hamlet structures, the ceramics in the hamlet structures, all the way down to the floors and into the pits were a mixture of classic memories, black and white, and those later ceramics. Ceramics that were not supposed to have been there until the early 1200s, classic ceramics that were not supposed to have continued after 1130. But there was a mixture. Most of it was in the form of sherds, but we were fortunate in a few cases to be able to find these different ceramics in nearly whole form associated with one another. This is a, two classic membrane bowls. These are both classic membrane bowls right here. And this is a Chupadero jar. These are not supposed to have been made after 1130. These are not supposed to have occurred in the Eastern Membrace area until into the early 1200s. But here they are in the Hamlet sites on the floor associated with one another. This kind of association, this kind of construction sequence that we can see in these well-preserved sites demonstrates an overlap between the classic and post-classic wares and, the pl and a continuity of occupation in the Eastern Membrace area. Not everybody left. They just didn't live in villages anymore in the Eastern Membrace area after 1130 until the early 1200s, but they lived in these hamlet settlements. So the sequence looks something like this now. I started off by telling you about the classic and the post-classic, and now I've inserted, based on the work in the Eastern Membrace area, the reorganization phase. So people moved from villages to hamlets. So a hamlet would be essentially the same as one room lock here. And then back into very large aggregated village settlements. We defined that, renamed that in the Eastern Membrace area as the reorganization phase. Once we'd recognized it, we'd recognized this association of pottery, also classic with later ceramics, some of the people working in the Membrace area looked back at the sites there and were able to see at Old Town and at Nanrun a small cluster of rooms on the edges of those villages that were not left, that were not abandoned when people left those villages in 1130, but continued to be occupied when people used the classic and the post-classic ceramics together. So continuity and change are added to the membrane sequence. In the Eastern Membrace, it's called reorganization phase. In the Membrace Valley, it's called the Terminal Classic because people didn't reorganize so much as stay in the same place, a few people. I like this Membrace black and white bowl. This is a drawing of a Membrace period black and white bowl. It's a style three. And some pottery analysts have suggested that it connotes transformation with continuity. Something Membrace people, or excuse me, people in the Membrace region experience in their lifestyles, in their identities, and in their forms of community. And this information is possible for us based on our ability to be able to work in places where people have really applied that preservation ethic to sites. And my third story. This final story begins to show us the way people thought about the places that they lived. Well-preserved deposits document the way in which people dedicated their homes or houses as they built them, the way they used ritual closure on some of their rooms, and the way in which they came back to those same places to mark either the place or the ancestors, but came back and left deposits that we can see because Nobody's been in there mushing around with the fill of these rooms. <clears throat> so I'll give you a few quick examples of building, closure, and revisiting. This is a classic membrane site in the Eastern Membrace area that's up on a, a high, it's one of the rare ones that's up on a high ridge. Many of the sites had their walls well preserved and in looking at the walls and studying the walls, you were able to see that there's a lot of ground stone, grinding stones, metates, manos, mortars, that are incorporated into the wall rock of those rooms. And, I, and we were not at all surprised to find 
pieces like this, where this one actually is ground all the way through. Uh, so there's a hole in the bottom. It's used up. It's expended. So it's expended ground stone. It's there. You're building cobble houses. Why not? Uh, we, we're not surprised to see that. What we're very surprised to see is the high frequency of the incorporation of unused ground stone into structures. So here you're looking across, you're, we're in a room, a classic memories room, we're looking across the hearth of that room through a doorway to another room. And this, this side of the doorway is made with a metate, which had barely, barely been used. So that is some, some work getting the right stone, preparing it as a matate, and then saying, ah, never mind, I'll put it in the house. Um, and people are incorporating, they're incorporating especially matates and monos that are brand new. Make a mono and then put it in the wall and then plaster it over. It's not being put in the wall so you can pull it out and use it. It's being put in the wall as part of the fabric of the home so the people building it are incorporating into the, sorry, are incorporating into the fabric their grinding tools that they've made but not used. And then no one sees it. They know it's there, but all this is plastered over. This doorway is plastered. So you don't see that matate. You don't see any of the brand new monos that are incorporated into walls. Similarly, we found incorporated into walls brand new projectile points and two of these beautiful gypsum daggers that were incorporated into the floor of one of the rooms. Again, it's not that they're putting the projectile points into niches so they can pull them out and use them later. They're incorporated into the stone construction of the room. They are the fabric of the structures. If we grant that these different kinds of materials, the grinding stones on the one hand, the hunting tools on the other hand, represent different roles in a household, maybe gendered roles. You can argue about that. Either way, this is information about how hunters and maze grinders, or perhaps men and women, both had roles, possibly integrated roles, in defining and dedicating and identifying their home. Closure. This classic memories period room at Flying Fish Village was closed using four colors that Pueblo people associate with the cardinal directions, white, blue, red, and yellow, and are the colors also of different lines of maize. In closing this room as people were leaving, they ground a substantial amount of yellow ochre, red ochre. They gathered up very white ash. There wasn't any blackness in it at all and they ground up turquoise and made powder out of it. And then they spread it in these different parts of the room, not overlapping, and all of the artifacts on the floor in those different areas are rubbed with the color of that area. These are the colors that Pueblo people recognize as associated with cardinal direction, people in the Western Pueblos. In addition to the coloration of the room, there's a badger skull placed in the northeast corner. And of course, badger <coughs> in the Western Pueblos is, has a valued ceremonial role. Michelle Hegman and I have argued in one of our edited publications um, with SAR that people in the Membrace, some of the people from the Membrace area gradually moved north and were incorporated into the Western Pueblos. And perhaps this is some evidence to support that idea. Here's another kind of closure. This is a closure of a post-classic room. That last one was a classic room. This is a post-classic room. Two-story, so here's the ceiling uh, floor of the upper story, ceiling of the lower story, floor of the upper story, roof of the structure. Here's the ground surface, this little funky looking thing that looks like a basket, that's supposed to represent the hearth. When people left this room, they took out the upper floor, they took out the lower floor, and they scattered a yellow powdered substance over the whole floor area. They really chopped that flo those floors out. You could hardly see that they were ever there. The next slide I show you, you can just see the edge of the wall where the floor was chopped out. They put a yellow substance covering the floor. 
They had left the area right around the hearth intact. They put a concentration of olive oil shell beads on that floor, on that yellow substance, and then a pronghorn head. They then entirely plastered one of the walls, new plaster, and put deep finger grooves across that wall. There wasn't a hand in the deposit. I've got the hand there, so I remember to tell you there were finger grooves in this newly plastered wall. They put in a little more fill and then another pronghorn head very near where the first one was placed. This was the closure of this room. This is Karen Schollmeyer excavating that room. Right here behind her, you could see where the floor was chopped out. And this wall shows you, right here you can see the diagonal deep grooves. Those are finger marks, finger grooves that people put into that wall. We get to see this because this was an unlooted room because the deposits were intact. We were able to see those pronghorn heads being near each other in the closure of the room. We're able to see the finger marks. So back to that room that Karen was excavating. Over time, the roof collapsed. I'll go back, here's the roof. It collapses down into the area of the pronghorn, the second pronghorn. The walls start to cave in. Lots of fill accumulates. This is a two meter, a two meter high wall. Lots of fill accumulates. And then someone comes back and puts another pronghorn in the fill right in the area of the first two pronghorns. And the same kind of severed head pronghorn. We're quite certain that the people who came back and revisited were either the same people who lived in this room or their descendants, or certainly someone who was close to this occupation because everything all of these collapsed walls was covered up. They couldn't see this. They didn't know it was there. Well, they didn't know by seeing it. They probably knew about it before they came back. So we're pretty certain that in this particular case, we're seeing the same people or descendants of the same people coming back and putting, revisiting the site for reasons we need to understand. We found other kinds of evidence of deposits that are from revisiting. We found clusters of animal bone um, in one case, a cluster of hawk wings um, in the fill of a room. Lots of different kinds of stone offerings that are placed in rooms, different shapes and sizes. And again, as with er the earlier story that I told you tonight, it raises new questions for us to be able to see these kinds of deposits. Did men and women have different but integrated roles in establishing their new homes? Which of these homes gets ritual closure and which not. We need to see a lot more of them to be able to understand that. And who is it that's coming back to settlements and why? Is it the same people who had lived there? Is it others? Is it just a practice of people over time to come back to the old places that their ancestors <laughs> lived in? Again, all important questions that require a lot of further study of deposits that have not been scrambled around uh, from looting. This is actually a, a village that's been completely bulldozed. Unfortunately, looting archaeological sites by hand and with machinery became a tradition in the Membrace region by the earliest, early 20th century, probably earlier than that. But a preservation research and education ethic is changing that. And Archaeology Southwest is playing a valuable role in that leadership. And again, I want to say a few words that Bill Doley has given us. He says, and I quote, preservation archaeology embodies a commitment to study traces of people's lives in the past, share that knowledge, and protect the places that hold those stories. I've shared a few of those stories today that were made possible by good people, the landowners in the Eastern Membrace area, caring about site protection. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. And so now we'll open this up to some questions. And we actually have a uh, Facebook audience that's been with us too. So Linda Pierce may have some questions that come in from uh, over Facebook as well. So anyone have a question? And I'll run the microphone over to you. 
was that a picture of footprints in one of the it was on the, the oh, lower yes. left hand corner yes right I, I, for, I neglected to mention that that is a petroglyph from the eastern membrace area um, of footprints of human footprints um, on a boulder and uh, to me it conveys a sense that people in the membrace tradition understood their relationship to the landscape did involve moving. But that's just me making that up. But that's, that's what it makes me think when I see it. What's the latest over in New Mexico about the damming of the Gila and will that affect any sites? Um, Bill can answer that question better than I can or Karen perhaps um, in the Gila. And the answer to the question is yes. It, it, there are archeological sites all over um, the upper Gila, so it will impact sites. Bill? And I'm not sure I can, Karen, can you update us there? Last I heard, they're still arguing about it, <laughs> but there's still people who want some kind of damming or diversion, and there's still people who don't. Um, if they do do something, it's definitely gonna affect sites and the places where they're talking about building structures are places where sites are, uh, but Last I heard, everyone's still arguing. Just a uh, just a parallel case, but quite uh, quite old. When the Elephant Butte Dam was was constructed, which was in the 1900s, uh, there are there were incredibly large classic memory sites that were completely obliterated. We'll never get to know anything about them. In fact, we know very little about classic memory occupation right on the Gila. Because, excuse me, right on the Rio Grande, because of all of the damage that's been done by damming and by recreation. Uh, did you find any uh, human burial sites or jewelry or human artifacts that they might have worn? Yeah. Um, we, the, the personal items that we found um, would have been from in the fill of rooms we did not excavate any burials. We have a burial permit um, with the state of New Mexico that's been approved by various Indian groups and um, we agreed not to excavate. So if we encountered a burial, and in, fortunately in membrane sites, it's really consistently below the floors. So you can actually study the room without having to excavate the burial. And in the Eastern Membrace area also, there just aren't that many burials. The population density there is quite low. And um, so if we had even wanted to excavate the burials, which we didn't, there wouldn't have been enough of a sample to say very much. In um, some of the earlier drawings I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that you uh, displayed, um, there seemed to be rooms with no exterior walls. Uh, Anna was curious about that. Uh, how did, how were those interior rooms used? Oh, no walls exterior to the room block? Yes. How were the interior rooms? Some interior rooms <coughs> were storage rooms um, in that they had no features, no hards or grinding features or anything in them. And, and so some of them were storage rooms. Um, but some of them are regular residential domestic rooms. And uh, they are sometimes connected to outer rooms by doorways and sometimes they're not. So some of them are, as you say, pretty isolated in the room block with the only entryway really down through the roof, um, the roof hole. Um, so it's a mixture, but they are re regular domestic rooms in the interiors of room blocks. Peggy, I have the microphone. I'm going to come over here so you can see me. <laughs> um, I, there's actually two, uh, several questions from Facebook that, can, that relate to the issues of protection and preservation. Um, one gentleman asks, so is private ownership as important as public for preservation efforts? And then sort of related to that is a woman is asking, are there protected sites like the ones you found in the east, are there any protected sites still in the Mimbris Valley? So is private ownership useful and what's yeah. protected in Mimbris yeah. itself? Um, 
If we had laws in the United States, like they have in Great Britain, where all historic properties are properties of the crown, uh, regardless of where they occur, then it wouldn't really matter what kind of property they're on. The benefit of public property is that we can hope, it's not always the case, but we can hope it won't be sold. In the Eastern Membrace, the private landowners have been diligent about protecting sites. Not every one of them, of course, but um, the ones that we've worked with, and, and the one, a lot of the area is privately owned by people who are incredibly dedicated to protecting those sites. Um, on one of the big pieces of property we worked on, it's owned by 12 families, a collective, and um, they will not build a single structure including a fence or anything, without us going out there and clearing it for them, making sure there's no archaeological materials. If there are, they'll move it someplace else. Um, they're that dedicated. Even a bunch of flakes, which I love, um, <laughs> they won't build there. They won't disturb the ground there. So that kind of private land ownership is extremely valuable. And it's probably, I'm not going to make friends in the government by saying this, it's probably more effective than public land ownership um, because they can be incredibly diligent. It's their land and they're there. So I would say there's not, it's not that one is entirely better than the other, it's just that they both have different benefits and disadvantages. So a non answer, but. Um. And uh, protected sites in Membrus? Oh, in the Membrus Valley? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> there are privately protected sites. One of the reasons, um, if you ever have a chance to read about the Nan Ruin, that's where Harry Schaefer did the bulk of his work in the Membrace Valley, and that's a privately owned and very well protected, very, very well protected site. And Harry was able to get a lot of detail. That detail about people building on the edges of room blocks and coming and going, and those are more ephemeral structures than the ones inside. And a lot of other things that he's been able to identify about suites of rooms, to your question of what are those interior rooms used for and what are they like, Harry was able to do that work at the Nan Ruin. It's right in the central Membrace Valley, um, just south of the main highway that goes, goes through that part of New Mexico. Um, if you ever have a chance to read about it, it's a wonderful study. But that's, I think, to me, that's one of the, best examples of private ownership and um, protection of sites in Members Valley. I thought that your diagram showing the classic village, then a space. Where are you? Oh, I'm here. Oh, OK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the classic village, then the post-classic, and then the hamlets in between. I thought it was very vivid. Oh, thank you. Do you have speculation? Do we know anything about why? people would have chosen or been forced to leave a somewhat structured village and displace themselves yes. into these rather sketchy hamlets? Right, that's a really good question. And um, it's a question that has driven a lot of research, research in the Membrace area. What happened to the Membrace people? Why did they leave? We've done a lot of work on that. Um, some people argue that it, <coughs> it is, it does, co the final, Depopulation of Membrace villages does coincide with a very, with an extremely long dry period. So one could say, oh, well, it was just extremely long and dry, and so they had to go. However, there's a more dry, longer dry period right when they move into those classic villages in the first place. So having to leave the region, 70% of the of people in the Membrace classic left the region. So th what we're talking about, the people who remained behind were about 30 or 40 percent, depending on where you are. In the eastern Membrace, it's about 40 percent. In the Membrace Valley, it's about 30 percent stayed, maybe less. Um, so they left. It did get dry. That contributed to their, to their leaving. But also, they had um, done a, a lot of damage to the floodplain, and that was their main agricultural area. They had depleted the, the artiodactyl, the deer um, resources, and rabbit just don't fill in the same way as deer do. So there had been 
reduction of re some natural resources. There had been depletion of some kinds of environmental settings. Um, and there was a dry period, and the population was at its peak. So all those things combined help us understand uh, why they moved away. Now there's also the potential that there were more attractive places to be than where they were, um, that there were people doing things that were, quote unquote, more interesting um, than what they were doing in the Membrace Valley. So there's a lot of potential for thinking about why they left, but all these factors play a role what they did to the environment, what they did to the resources, the high level of population, the way in which people created their communities. These are communities that, are, that may have been of the size that it was just hard to stay together without having some kind of real institutionalized leadership. And in the Membrace classic period, we don't see any strong institutionalized, that is people who will always stay in the role of leader in those villages at all. So maybe 130 years, about as long as you can make that work. Um, all those things play a role. So it's a good question. We can squeeze one more question in. There was a, a slide that had several pots. Yep. And there was a polychrome pot on the bottom in the center, which was very, very much. Close your eyes. This it will make looked you like uh, Pocky May. Uh, Casas Grandes pottery, yeah. the same. Was there a lot of overlap between those two cultures, the members and the Pakimai culture? Yeah, I'm just going to go back to the. There. You there. Go. Are you talking about Ramos? Ramos. Uh huh. This Ramos polychrome there? Yeah, it sure looks a lot, a lot like the, some of the pots well, out of the Casas Grandes area. That's another really good question. Um, Steve LeBlanc, many years ago, argued that there that people in the Membrace at, at around 11.30 were drawn down into northern Mexico in the, the Pakime area, became enculturated into that way of being, and then came back up to the Membrace Valley, they or others. Um, that's possible. We also find, though, that this all these these six different kinds of painted pottery co-occur with classic members black and white at Hamlet sites. So does that mean that the people who turned their field camps into hamlets then welcomed in other people, people from the south, to be part of their communities? And then that blossomed and turned into those bigger sites that we call the post-classic? I think that's probably the case. So I think Steve's right and I'm right. That works for both of us. Uh, but um, so there, there has to be some certainly knowledge of each other, if not incorporation. Well, let's thank Peggy one more time here. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.